Hey everybody, today we are going to talk all about contract brewing. I know all of our guests today have a lot to share with you, so we're going to dive right in. But John, because you are to the right of me, you could give everybody a brief introduction to kick things off. Sure, sure. My name is John Samankowitz. Uh, I'm with Beer Law Center based out of Raleigh, North Carolina, um, and I practice exclusively alcohol law. Uh, so I work with breweries, wineries, and distilleries in the southeast and, and around the country. And it was great to finally share a beer with you in September of 2020. Right? That was fantastic. And there's a great picture of you. I'll have to drop this in the comments somewhere where John is looking at the camera, just pointing at them, having the best time in the world. So <laughs> great to see you outside of the screen, but always a pleasure on screen as well. Trey, you're up. Yeah, Trey Sinclair, founder, president of Dry County Brewing and Dry County Spirits out of Kennesaw, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. Uh, we started out as a bean contract brewed back in 2015, and uh, we've brewed our own beer since 2016, but we now also contract brew for some other partners. Awesome. Well, nice to meet you as well, Trey. Thanks for being here. Bob, your turn. Uh, I'm Bob Grigsby with Big Kettle Brewing. Uh, we are a purpose-built contract brewery in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Thanks for being here, Bob. And Jason, this was your plan to have this session. So <laughs> last but not least, Jason Sleeman, what do you do in the world of beer? Yeah, so I uh, finance breweries. Uh, and so I try and give people money. So I get to see all these cool people doing different things and say, you know, this is an interesting topic from a both a financial, legal, and um, just administrative opportunity. So I, I finance breweries. So Jason, I have two follow-up questions for you. The easy one, or they're both pretty easy. What does it say on your hat? I can't quite make it out. I'm curious. So this is where when you go to trade shows and you like to collect hats, you pick one up. So this is actually a country malt hat and it is an American flag and it's uh, all the different uh, ingredients that go into beer. Oh, That's very cool. cool. Very cool. Well, second question, Jason, because you are the mastermind behind this conversation today. What is contract brewing? Give us a definition to work from today. <laughs> oh, man, this will John. And everybody else, feel free to correct Jason or add anything to this. But the way, the way I look at contract brewing <laughs> is it's an opportunity for one brewery to brew beer and create your brand, cans, do whatever. Um, on your behalf. So it's taking their capacity and Trey's uh, situation where they have extra capacity and they are putting that to work for another brewery or in Bob's situation is where you're getting this big official contract and they become your manufacturing arm. So contract brewing is just manufacturing beer for someone else other than yourself. Awesome. So what's the situation, everyone, where you could consider, you know, having your beer as contract brewed by someone else? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll kick that one off of, you know, off the top of my head, there's a couple of reasons why we have looked at it in the past and why folks have looked to us uh, or to Bob's company. Uh, you know, one, when we got started in 2015, we, it was myself with no money and no, no experience. I couldn't get uh, banking finance. So uh, breweries are obviously very capital intensive. And without that capital contract brewing was really my only route to market. So I used contract brewing as a proof of concept for banks and investors. So I think that's that's a, a big reason um, or a big way. Uh, a, another is potentially, you know, looking at, at producing a product uh, that is not in your current wheelhouse or in your current capability, right? So if you want to make a, a seltzer or an RTD or an, an A beer, um, but potentially you don't have that equipment um, and you want to trial it somewhere else, that might might also be an opportunity. I'm sure Bob can add to it. Some might be, you know, expanding geographies out of your home market or something and using a partner closer to that market you're expanding to. I'm sure Bob deals with that regularly. Yeah, Bob, I'd love to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Trey kind of hit the nail on the head there. So, you know, our customers are, are generally somebody that has uh, reached capacity in their current location. Uh, and, you know, we're primarily focused on their their, their mainline beers uh, that are going into, into distribution. Uh, so, you know, we'll help them, you know, take that beer to scale. Um, and then kind of our second profile of customer is uh, generally going to be a brand that's got a big marketing arm. Uh, you know, we have a, we do se several celebrity brands that are, uh, you know, just well capitalized. Are you able to share the details of which celebrities? Uh, you know, really all of our contract customers are, are confidential, uh, you know, uh, we'll dive into that shortly. I was curious to test you on wink, that. Wink, wink, yeah. nudge, nudge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we would have to get permission. For there's them. not a Jason yeah. Sleeman oh, beer right. banker bruise you're making? Pardon? I said there's not a Jason Sleeman beer banker bruise brand you're working with right now? We're working on that, yeah. Uh, we're going to put his handsome mug on the side of the can. Um, 
but we won't uh, sell a beer. We won't sell a beer if we do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you know we're you know primarily focused on on beer and seltzer. Uh, we've done a lot of seltzer production over the past couple of years. Um, but um, you know we we've got a, a four vessel fifty barrel brew house. So you know generally our, our uh, minimum batch size is a fifty barrel batch. Now, Bob, was it your business plan all along to contract brew so much for others? It was. So uh, we launched day one with the intention of being a contract brewery. And uh, by doing so, it enabled us to launch at scale. So uh, that, you know, I would say 90 percent of our production is geared towards the third party side, which enabled us to launch, you know, with the four vessel 50 barrel brew house. Um, We've got the ability to incrementally add additional fermenters uh, to increase that capacity. And ultimately, if we're if we were doing 100 percent beer, uh, we'll have capacity uh, for about uh, 90,000 uh, barrels a year. And if we were doing kind of a mix of seltzer just because of the throughput, you know, that could reach, you know, uh, potentially 180,000 barrels a year. Now, Bob, you know, I think we're going to spend a bit of the conversation kind of looking at Trey's angle a bit more. But from your side of things, when should a brewery consider contract brewing for others? You know, uh, uh, I, I would say it, it's, you know, uh, Trey has a very sophisticated system, but not everybody is, is necessarily set up to contract brew. Just because you have excess capacity doesn't mean you are, you know, in a position to contract brew. Um you know, launching, you know, in our case, in, in brewing at scale, you know, we do have very sophisticated equipment. Uh, we have a 32 uh, head rotary filler. We've got inline uh, shrink wrap uh, labeler with uh, with a, with shrink wrap capabilities. Uh, you know, we've got what's called FT Brew, which uh, Factory Talk Brew, which is a collaboration between Rockwell Automation and McRae Engineering. So it's a very sophisticated uh application that gives uh, both our, ourselves and our customers uh, over a thousand touch points on their beer. So uh, it, it really, I, I would say a lot of our customers have uh, better understand their beer after brewing with us than they ever did before. Oh, that's really interesting. We'll dive into that a little bit. John, go ahead. Yeah, if I can just jump in for a second and, and Bob and Trey's systems and, and focus is absolutely right. But I work a lot with very small breweries, especially startups. And one of the other things I've seen is people, you know, on the the customer brewery side looking for contract brew, contract brewing help. Um, and we saw it a lot during uh, COVID and the lockdown is when it doesn't when you need to change beyond your existing business model. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of folks, the common wisdom was sell as much as you can over the over the countertop. And so lots of breweries just didn't even have a packaging facility or a packaging means. Um, or that they're now, gosh, we're going to go into distribution and we don't want, you know, we need to set out our flagships farther and wider without going that capital intensive route. So there's, you know, a couple of, uh, even on the smaller, less than 50 barrel batches, a lot of impetus to do some of that work as well. Yeah. Take a try. I, I think that's a great call out. I think that is, um, you know, kind of one differentiator between the two approaches that, that Big Kettle or Dry County have, right? I think Big Kettle and Bob hit on it. Those are, for the most part, regional, national, uh, very well capitalized brands coming in, wanting to go into a market and and have a partner like Big Kettle who has all the bells and whistles, all the lab testing, all the, you know, the things you should have if you're a, a super well capitalized brand and going regional or national. Uh, whereas Dry County is more on the other side, John, to your point of, hey, a local brewery needs, you know, 30 extra barrels here or there, or doesn't have a canning line instead of using a mobile canner, they use us to brew and can the beer, um, you know, different things like that. So our partners are all local partners um, on a small scale. Um, and, you know, we have two brew houses, a, a 30 barrel and a 10 barrel. Um, and we primarily use our 30 barrel for the contract guys. It makes more sense, but we're flexible. And in the past have brewed 10 barrel batches for contract partners, which is that kind of just local test, get the product in the market, see how it works. Trey, your angle is fantastic because you see both sides of the operation. You started as a contract brand and you eventually brought production in-house. Now you offer contract services for other breweries, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and a big reason why we offer them is because we wouldn't have gotten our start without that opportunity. Right. And so, you know, this industry and yes, it's changed a lot over the past decade. Uh, but I think there is 
one of the great things about this industry is still so much the camaraderie, um, you know, and the friendly competition uh, as much as anything. And so being able to uh, to help somebody else grow or expand or or launch um, and chase their dreams is is awesome to be able to do when it was done for you. So let's say, Trey, that, you know, Jason wants to chase his dreams and start contract brewing his brand. How do you decide if it's a good partnership? Well, I'm not going to brew Jason's beer. But, uh, <laughs> I'll go imaginary with imaginary Jason. Yeah. No, uh, That's the problem. Yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, and I think Bob will echo probably the same thing. A, a lot of it for me is it starts with, is there a, it's like any good partnership. Is there a good personality fit? Um, right off the bat, you don't want to get into a contract. In my opinion, you don't want to get into a contract with somebody that you're going to hate dealing with and working with down the line, right? Um, you know, I think one of my favorite stories about contract brewing is we we contract brewed out of Lazy Magnolia Brewery in Mississippi for a year. That's where we got started. And uh, Leslie Henderson, who's amazing, um, you know, she's honestly a craft beer pioneer in a lot of ways. And uh, and so. She, her and I were trading emails before we got started. I was e expressing my interest and she, she said, all right, well, I need you to come here in person uh, to, to, uh, to negotiate and discuss. And that's a, you know, seven and a half hour drive from where I was. And there was no, you know, I didn't notice this 10% likelihood to work out 90% likelihood to work out. But uh, she was like, if you don't, if you don't drive here, then, then no deal, you know? So I uh, got my car, drove to Mississippi, met with her. We sat at the table for about 30 minutes and she was like, all right, well, I have all the answers I need. You want to go grab a beer? I was like, well, that's it. I drove seven hours. She's like, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you weren't a crazy person uh, and that you were somebody I could have a conversation with and want to work with. Um, and I guess, honestly, to some point, too, probably dedicated enough to make the drive. But so I think, uh, you know, I'm getting long winded here, but I think a, a big part of it is does it make sense from a personality and fit standpoint? And then, you know, we'll get into things of does it make sense from a, a size and a scale and a scope? Uh, Bob and I were talking about this a little bit before the call. Uh, we have a contract partner now that used to be with Bob and uh, Bob was brewing great product for them, but, uh, and I think you could speak more to it, but mutually it was, they were not brewing enough beer to, to stay on board with you guys. Right. So yeah, scale yeah, down absolutely. to somebody like us. And so it's getting those scale and scope questions out of the way early. And then also, you know, capabilities, right. If somebody wants to contract brew a, a cider with, with Bob or with Lazy Magnolia. Maybe they can, maybe they can't, maybe they want them or don't want them, right? If somebody wants to brew a seltzer with us, maybe we're not the right fit, you know? So um, I think it's it's a fit question for me. A lot of you great know, To kind of reiterate what uh, Trey was saying, you know, we, we see this industry as very fraternal and, uh, you know, if it's not a right fit for us, we're going to, you know, uh, refer the refer them to Trey or, you know, we've referred to uh, uh Thomas Creek, uh, you know, if it's logistically not a fit for us, you know, we've referred folks up to New Realm in Virginia. So, uh, uh, yeah, and not every product's a, a fit. We, we have the ability to run uh, uh, 12 ounce, uh, 16 ounce and 19 twos, but but uh, to run a slim can on our line is a major undertaking and a, and a changeover. So, you know, we, we try to, you know, unless it was a big customer, that just doesn't make sense for us. Um, but, uh, you know, when we, we, we field a lot of calls, uh, a lot of startups, and uh, that's a challenge. Uh, you know, we you know, field a lot of calls that just you know, even are just an idea at the time. I love beer. My, my dad's got a bunch of money. You know, my we're friends with a distributor. I'm like, well, you know, do you have this, this and this set up? They're like, well, not yet. So that's that's very challenging. You know, we, we're just we're too big to be an incubator for, for, for a startup. Uh, unless that startup is really, uh, you know, well capitalized, um, generally, you know, kind of celebrity focused brand is, is, you know, what we've dealt with. And, and, and even so, you know, I think one of the big challenges, you know, with some of the startups is their projections. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they also, they often have, uh, you know, inflated uh, uh ideas of, of, of where the product's going to go. So, uh, you know, we really got to balance that out and, and have, you know, realistic uh, expectations. Yeah. A lot of great insights so far. You know, you all mentioned personality to make sure it's a good fit type of product, you know, batch size, you know, whether it's going to be one off, whether it's going to be recurring, where they expand, want to be in the future. A lot of really great ideas so far. Jason, is there anything you'd like to add? 
Yeah, and I we talked <clears throat> we're talking more about the option to contract, but I think another side of that coin is when you are going out to seek. So we've been talking more about the capacity and, and that, right? Trey talked a little bit about uh, you know how they started out and how it was helpful for the bank to be able to have a little bit of proof of concept. One of the things that we're seeing a lot of is we we are seeing brands that are being able to be a little bit bigger to the public than they really are. I can think of three or four brands here locally in Georgia where they're brewing, they're in cans. Now, granted, you know, you've got a, a founder or owner that's out kind of hand selling these cans uh, to try and get them out into, into the accounts and, and, and make those things happen. Um, but it is something that is helping those brands. The other part of that is, and, and I, you know, I, this has also happened to a couple of, you know, brands that I'm aware of, is the cost of failure is much less. So if you go to Trey, you know, probably not, uh, you know, there it's still cheaper even if you go to Bob for some big batches. But, you know, the cost of failure, if you realize, okay, this isn't going to work, um, and you've had a couple of um, runs, you've tried to sell the cans, and you just realize that your brand's not going to work or, or this isn't for you, um, it's a much uh, cheaper uh, lesson than it would be if you went out and started from scratch, um, built a brewery, uh, bought all the equipment, and, and then said, oh, man, this isn't what I wanted. So I think there is something to be said about engaging on the other side of this coin um, instead of just jumping in with both feet, it's a way to get in with a much lower lo learning uh, curve or, or expense. Indeed. And no trade going back to when you first launched, what are your thoughts on simply launching as a contract brand? You know, did it teach you any unique skills, any lessons learned from the early days? Yeah, I think, you know, my point of view on it would be when we did it 2015, doesn't sound like that long ago, but again, the industry's changed so much back then, there was a pretty negative stigma around contract brewing um, and are you really a craft brewery if you're contracted? And and I was you know very hypersensitive to that, and I understood it. It was just literally my only option. Um, you know, we had several distributors who, uh, including the one where we are today, that was that was very hesitant about bringing us on as a contract brewery and very honest and upfront about that. Um, I think that stigma's to to a big degree lessened uh, because there are so many very good and very craft contract brewed beers now and. Then also you have so many celebrity backed brands now that are obviously contracted but are extremely popular um, so i think that stigma has gone down a little bit so to jason's point i think it makes it even more of a viable option to start out where there's less of a, a negative marketing impact to you um and then i think yeah it just it makes it way easier to do uh from a a financing and also a cash flow standpoint so um it's uh you know i think it's I don't know about specific lessons per se, but I think it's definitely a, uh, it's the stigma has changed today. Trey, did it make you focus more on marketing and branding? I, I think it allowed me to focus more on those, right? Uh, because I wasn't chained to the brew house or the canning line per se. I was able to get out into accounts more as, as kind of a, a one man, two man show back then. Right. So um, again, it all goes back to, to capitalization and, and financing uh as much as we don't want it to it, it it all comes down to dollars and cents at the end of the day and so yeah it definitely allowed allowed myself and allows other brands to focus more on on marketing and sales uh which is which is obviously going to be the driver well and if i can just jump in too one of the things and 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 like bob and trey and probably even jason i get those phone calls too like oh i got this idea and this is what i want to do and i want you know a contract i want a contract uh, produce my beer so I don't have to do anything with it. You've got to be very careful as well and know your state because there are a lot of state regulations that can impact what you can and can't do from a contract brewing perspective. Um, just as an example here in North Carolina, in order to contract brew, you yourself have to be a brewery. So if you are not a brewery in North Carolina and you want to contract brew, you've got to go outside of the state to find a brewery to make your beer. Now you've got a problem of getting it back into the state to, to because you're not allowed to take possession of it. So there's a lot of intricacies that can vary really heavily state to state. And this goes back to, you know, picking the right contract brewery to work with as well, because they shouldn't, you know, they're the ones with the experience if you're just getting into this. Now, John, we'll dive deeper into the legal side of things right now. Really great insight just now. So 
you all find someone who's the perfect fit. You know, someone's the contract brewer, someone's the brand. You come together, you like each other, you're ready to go into this together. Looking at that agreement, John, what should you consider and how formalized should this be? Well, um, I'll start by saying that, yes, it should definitely be in writing. Uh, I don't care how good of friends you are with this, this person, how wonderful they are to play golf with or whatever. A handshake deal is, is generally not what you want to uh, bet your, your brand reputation on, even if things go well, right? Um, and it was fun, you know, uh, prior to this, uh, the three or four of us kind of exchanged emails about, you know, what are some important things? And I got to tell you, I was just thrilled that somebody besides the lawyer was like, get it in writing. We need to have something in writing. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've seen bad contract brewing agreements. I've seen great contract brewing agreements. And um, there are some points to consider. And I'm really going to, you know, push back to, to Bob and Trey to get their insight. But the main thing in my mind is, Sort of like Robert Frost said, good fences make good neighbors. Know what the expectations are and know what the deliverables are, whatever that means to you in your situation. Bob, Trey, what, what have you seen and what do you want to see in, in agreements? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree on that. Uh, I think it's important to kind of have, you know, that contract, that agreement, uh, you know, defining the relationship, but also defining the volume. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen is, is so challenging is, uh, you know, production, you, you know, the markets just, especially with, with COVID, uh, December, you know, has always kind of dropped off and, and then January it is slow and, but it, it's gotten drastically slower. It almost comes to a halt. Uh, and then everybody wants production, you know, uh, you know, for the, for this kind of the spring reset. But, uh, as my partner Glenn says, you, uh, nine women can't make a baby in a month. And, uh, so we've got to, uh, you know, kind of level out that production and start kind of building up inventory going into the spring so that we can accommodate all of our customers. Uh, and so that's where, you know, having that, you know, contractual agreement is, is so important that really defines uh, not just the legalities, but that, but the timing of, of, uh, of everything. Trey, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think from a contractual standpoint, exactly that kind of the whole, the whole product life cycle. Uh, how are we going to, um, one, agree on recipe and, and quality up front. And then two, how are we going to get into orders, right? What's the lead time we need from the day you tell me you want a 50 barrel batch uh, to the, to the time that I put it in a tank. And then, uh, and then at, when the product's done and in kegs or cans, what's the timeline and, and expectations on you getting that product out of my brewery, right? Cause that's an angle that I think a lot of people don't think about is you're going to be bringing on, you know, different colored pack techs or different, uh, boxes or different case trays. Uh, it's not just the beer that you're brewing, right? There's a lot of, a lot of storage. And, um, if you're not a purpose built, uh, contract brewery, like we are not, then, then space is even more limited and, and, uh, and at a premium. Um, and so you've got to deal with that. And then, uh, you know, what is the expectation? Nobody's, you know, you know, uh, like Sam at Dogfish says, you know, a business plan is the greatest work of fiction. So we don't really know uh, what what volume is going to look like in 12 months or 24 months, especially like Bob mentioned, a lot of these brands are startup with zero with with zero historicals. Right. Um, but we need to we need to have plans in place for what happens if volume is 200 percent of what we're talking about or what if it's 50 percent of what we're talking about. Um, are you going to is it going to make sense to transition you up or down to another partner uh, or renegotiate pricing because it, you don't have the economies of scale or you have better economies of scale, um, different things like that. So I think, yeah, just touching on every point of the kind of product life cycle and supply chain along the way is, is important. Now, Trey, yeah. when a brand engages with you and they're planning out that schedule we've talked about, you know, how far in advance are you setting these brew dates and the batch batch amounts? And, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. That way, you know, because obviously you have a production schedule, but how do you make sure they fit in with it? You know, one thing I, I'll just kind of uh, uh, 
chime in here it, that's so important. It's not just uh, you know scheduling the brew date. It's uh, ordering the the labels, uh, you know, getting the uh, the proper approvals. So all that you know takes time. Uh, you you know you've got to get your artwork approved. You got to get your you know labels printed, um, and that's you know all that is taking longer than it than it used to. So uh, that's something that you know you've got to take into account uh, when 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 this when scheduling. If you want to get your beer out on a certain day, you got to make sure that you know. All those, uh, yeah, all that has been done as well up front. Um, you know, I mean, we, we even, you know, we do have, you know, calls from folks that don't have distribution lined up yet uh, that are working you know, or may have distribution in one state, but kind of the projections are geared towards having distribution, uh, you know, set in, in multiple states. So, you know, that's important that, you know, you've got your labels, you've got, you know, uh, your, your distribution and all that really uh, buttoned up up front. In, in order to uh, kind of meet the demands of the contract. Jason, I'd love to dive into the finance perspective of this one. Is there anything you'd like to see in the contract between the partners? <clears throat> I'll tell you transparently, I don't get into the um, contract as much. So, you know, for the clients that we have, I, you know, I, sometimes I'll say, oh, we're contracting this beer, we'll do it, whatever, right? So I, I do <clears throat> think that an important part of it is understanding, you know, what does this do to your financials? You know, so as distribution continues to pull back um, or you're looking and saying, I can make more, I, 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 you know, it's, it's always interesting. You try and be a little bit cautious with the names, but, you know, it, it's been interesting to watch how um, as some breweries have decided to pull back, um, you know, and you've had other breweries that have not been as profitable that those become really unique marriages because one gets to go back and say, we're not going to produce, we're going to, to scale down. And the other says, well, we really haven't had enough volume to be profitable. And now this pushes us through the volume because you're still at least getting, um, you know, you're, you're not getting your best margins on that uh, contracted beer, but you're still getting very solid margins on that. And, and it's enough to pay your employees and keep your lights on and do that kind of stuff. And so increasing that volume is, is, is very helpful. So, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I would want to see in the contract is less on the contract and more just you understanding your numbers and making sure that you're not, you know, getting yourself into something that is a loss leader, but it's something that is making a, a good profit for you. No, that makes yeah, sense. Jason, that's, uh, that brings up a good point. You know, I, I think oftentimes, you know, some of, our, some of our customers that are really taking that leap from just brewing in-house to brewing, uh, to contract brewing with us, you uh, don't necessarily know the true cost of, of brewing in-house. Uh, and, uh, and I think one of the things, especially in this environment right now with rising uh, raw material cost, uh, you know, can cost, you know, we, we can buy, you know, in bulk and get better economies of scale. So it really does narrow that margin sum from what your costs are in-house to what your, uh, you know, your cost of contract brewing because of our, our, our buying power and ability to, to you know, again, buy at scale. Bob, that's a great point. Lines, John, go ahead. I was just going to say along those lines, something that we've seen a lot, just working with a lot of, in particular, startups and small independent folks, going back to knowing your numbers is understanding the cycle time, right? Between when I place an order, when do I have to pay for it? When do I get the product? When do I sell the product? How do I actually get paid for it? Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes those are not necessarily linear, you know, and a net 30 may not always be a net 30 either. Um, and just understanding that when you're moving from, as you said, I'm selling most of my product over the bar top or I'm self-distributing in a small area now looking to go beyond that, understanding how that, that works with now a third party, that partner brewery out there in, in, in that production scheme with your product. Well, so many things to dive into. And I'll take the financial side of things first that, John, you hinted on. And this is the question that we had. You know, What sort of down payment is normally required to start on production in a contract brewing engagement? Does anyone want to provide any, you know, ballparks on that uh you know kind of uh, yeah based on kind of lead times now and uh you know kind of in, increased raw materials you know we've gone to uh, uh, uh we started at, at, with a 50 percent down payment now we've gone to a 75 percent down payment uh -huh. yeah. thanks for sharing that, bob trey you want to agree disagree we're 50 percent down well awesome. now let's say, your, go ahead john i was gonna say one of the things i do love about this industry is that people can be very creative. One of the things I hate about this industry is that people can be very creative. Um, and, you know, 
with with contract brewing, like with anything else, we can be creative about how this is done. You know, and it may not fit Big Kettle Brewing. It may not fit Dry County. But I've worked with some clients where, you know, okay, Brewery X has some extra brew house capacity. Brewery Y wants to use some of that. I've even seen situations where, okay, tell you what, I want you to contract brew my beer for me. I'm going to buy a fermenter and put it in your facility. And you're going to basically rent to own that, right? So I'm going to put this thing in and over, you're going to give me a discount on that contract brewing. And over a period of two years, that tank becomes yours. Now uh, that, you know, the host brewery gets an opportunity to increase their capacity with barely no cost and being covered. And the other folks don't have quite the capital impact of starting their own or, or expanding their own facility. So you can get sort of very creative and, and create win-win solutions for folks. But at bottom line, like Bob and, and Trey said, somebody's got to order the, the materials and that's money out of pocket for somebody. Yep. And on, just, go ahead. And on that, that is something we've put in all of our contracts and we had when we were on the other side is, is the option to buy a fermenter. And we're very specific about what size and brand and whatever that you can do. But we do give each of our customers the option to, to buy a single fermenter. Um, we've never had anyone take us up on it, but it, it is there. Um, and then we have had uh, customers that do purchase some or all of the raw materials themselves. Um, and then we have some customers that we do 100% of it. Um, and again, those have to, that's contracted on, it has to be approved and, and signed off on and so on and so forth. But um, we have, have had it go both ways. And I think especially you get into something like the can shortage that we, we had a couple of years back, you know, it, it did make more sense, I think, uh, to not potentially cut into our own um, can contracts or agreements or relationships and have some of those partners, uh, you know, utilize their own can contracts or get those, um, just take us off the hook for one, one more thing. Yeah, that's a great topic to dive into, kind of looking at responsibilities, you know, and Bob, you touched on it as well. Ingredients. Are you sourcing the ingredients for everybody? Trey, you mentioned cans, you know, are there typical industry standards for who's providing what in these arrangements? You know, that that can vary some, uh, you know, I, I would say kind of more on the seltzer side than, than the beer side for us. Uh, you know, we did, you know, some uh you know, specialty seltzers that had the specialty flavor packs and, uh, you know, we were buying that in bulk. And so, you know, oftentimes, you know, our, our customer would contract dire directly with the flavor house uh, for the flavor versus us buying the flavor from the flavor house. And I think it too depends when, what, what are you trying to reproduce, right? Is this something that's a, a brand new product that you're starting on your own or is starting through your contract brewery? Or are you trying to replicate a beer that's somewhere else, right? Or, or something. And, you know, I've run into it before with a client that was using a really specialty malt that was floor malted and hot, really expensive. Well, that may not make a hell of a lot of sense at the 50 barrel scale. Yeah. And so what do you do? How do you shift things? And, you know, okay, if you really want us to make 50 barrels with that particular malt, you're going to go get that particular malt because yeah. it's not a contract relationship we've got or, or it doesn't make sense for us to do it. Well, John, I, you know, I, I would say, you know, what we often do when we you know, first get the recipe and, and look at that is how can we value engineer that recipe for scale? Uh, so oftentimes there is the ability to uh, substitute you know, an ingredient that's, you know, more readily available and makes better sense uh, to you know produce at scale. And I would imagine once again, put it in the contract, right, Bob? And put it in the contract. That's right. So looking at recipe development, do you see for you and Trey, someone coming to you with a recipe that's pretty much done? Or do you have brands, maybe a celebrity perhaps who says, hey, I want to do a beer this style. What can you create for me? Uh, you know, we, we have done some recipe development. Uh, 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 you know, we, we did a, uh, a, a shandy at, at one point. It was our, our Kolsch and uh, a, uh, our customer's soda, um, which we, you know, developed that. And then, you know, we, we've also you know, done a lot of, uh, you know, we'll have a recipe where they're using something, as, as John and I were saying earlier, uh, maybe a, a pastry stout where they've got, they're putting in actual pastries and, you know, how can we do that without actually adding, you know, all these pastries in and, and kind of break down and help, you know, work with that customer to formulate that to where, again, it's, you know, it is scalable and you're not, you know, bringing in a dump truck full of pastries. So. Wait, Bob, you're trying to tell me that there are actually pastries in pastry stouts. 
uh, that there, there are some, uh, yeah, yeah, you'd be surprised what goes into some of these beers. So one, a local brewery here in Raleigh, uh, put in boxes and boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't um, want to clean out the mash ton after that, but they did it. You know. Yeah. Again. And, and th those are some other reasons why we <laughs> want to avoid, uh, those type situations. Well, we'll, we'll go alphabetically too. now. We're going from P's to Q's. Let's go from pastries to quality. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at quality, and Bob, you mentioned it earlier as well. I'd love everybody's feedback on this. Mm -hmm. How often are quality checks happening? You mentioned, Bob, that you have a lot of ability just because of your size to look into a lot of things that a smaller brewer can't. But how often are you checking the quality of the beer? Uh, we have a full lab service so uh, and, and a full-time lab te technician. So it, it's imperative for us to be checking on a, on a very regular basis. Uh, the, um, you know, we do know from, you know, just the equipment that we have that we're getting, you know, lower oxygen levels on our, our can line uh, and, and producing a, a very, you know, a good quality product, uh, which, you know, amounts to, uh, you know, you know, on our can line, you're getting, you know, better quality, you know, longer shelf life. Um, uh, our keg line, I think also, you know, extremely important. We treat every keg as a dirty keg and, uh, you'd be surprised it was supposed to be a clean keg is not necessarily a clean keg and what comes out of that keg. Uh, so we're doing an acid wash, caustic wash inside and out. And so uh, we, we end up with a perfectly clean keg, which again, you know, allows for, you know, better longevity, better quality uh, and, you know, really avoiding any sort of uh, uh, potential for any contamination. But, uh, but the lab checks are very routine and very important. Well, and then let me on, ask on our end, I, sorry, go ahead, Trey. Okay. Uh, sorry, real quick on our end, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, smaller craft brewery uh, quality is obviously still of the utmost importance. We just do it on a, on a, uh, you know, more rudimentary uh, scale. Um, but we, all of our partners we've worked with have been local to this point. So we, we offer and encourage the partner to come in at every step of the process and kind of, um, you know, stage gate that before it goes to the next, right? Before it before it goes uh, to the bright or before it gets dry hopped or before it gets packaged, uh, you know, to where you're incurring additional costs at each of those, right? And so, um, but for sure at the end, there's, there's quality and quality sign off from the partner um, prior to packaging so that, uh, you know, there are not, there are not uh, day one surprises opening a can and being like, this doesn't taste or having it on tap and saying, this doesn't taste like I wanted it to taste. Right. Um, and all that's in the contract in writing, like John said, um, and that if you don't partake in these quality uh, steps that are, that are offered to you, then you kind of void the warranty, so to speak on it. So. Have any of you had any situations that didn't go as planned, whether it's, you know, an ingredient or recipe didn't turn out as expected and someone wasn't happy at the end. And if so, how would you handle a situation like that? Uh, or perhaps yeah, hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, uh, you know, there, there, there's always challenges. Um, you know, we, we again, you know, we're, we're brewing a, a 50 barrel batch and because of the, the sophistication of our brew house, you know, we don't have a pilot system that, uh, that, that comes close to what we can do on our actual brew house. So, you know, we are brewing that 50 barrel batch, uh, you know, day one versus doing a, a, a pilot batch. So that's why it's so important, I think, to have that recipe, uh, you know, clearly defined uh, in, in the parameters, you know, clearly defined uh, from, from the get go. Uh, well, <laughs> Bob, this is something I think I saw in, in one of your notes earlier. And what I was going to actually suggest here is, one thing I see with with folks who are coming to me with, hey, I want to, you know, review this contract brewing agreement and it's OK, you know, Dry County Brands is uh, I want you to make 300 barrels of of, you know, Jason's IPA. And it's supposed to be six point five percent ABV and 78 IBUs. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's the extent of their characterization of the product. And I think, Bob, to your point, I think you said earlier, you know, it challenges the 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 brewery looking for contract help to know their own product right to be able to characterize it beyond well it's this srm and it's kind of hazy right you, you know what are those parameters that are important what is the after finish that you know you're looking for in developing that recipe that again you, you're going to lean on the the um 
the, the contract brewers because they've got the experience doing the scale up. But if you don't know you're looking for a certain parameter, it's really tough then to come back later and complain about it. Yeah, it, it is. And that's why we've got to have as much information up front. And, you know, we'll, we'll start with the recipe and then we'll, you know, have a Q&A session uh, with the, the, the brewer uh, who we're brewing for and, and make sure that, you know, we have a clear understanding of, of what they're looking for. And, you know, we want to, of course, taste that beer uh, that they've produced. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where not just, you know, the sophistication in the equipment comes in, that's where the expertise comes in. And uh, my partner, Glenn Sprouse, is, uh, you know, a veteran in this industry. Uh, you know, Glenn is really unique in that he understands both the operational side of the brewery uh, with an engineering background, uh, you know, went to UC Davis Brew School and really understands the art. I mean, he understands both the art and the science of brewing. So uh, it's a, you know, very unique skill set that, uh, you know, I think is very advantageous to our customers and, you um, you know, helps us uh, hit that mark, you know, f from the get go. Now, Trey and potentially Bob as well, from a staffing perspective and Trey, you brew your own brands, but you also brew for others as well. Do you have one team that handles it all or do you have people specifically dedicated to the contract side? So we at our scale uh, have one team that handles it all, right? So the guy brewing dry County IPA is also brewing contract IPA. Um, and, and a big reason why we contract is, you know, so that we can fully utilize our team um, year round. Like Bob said, it's a seasonal business to some extent and some products more than others. So to be able to cover those fixed costs and, and, you know, pay competitive wages and benefits and all of that, uh, you know, you want to fully utilize your tanks and you want to fully utilize your employees as well. So to some, to some extent, I'm sure, you know, or I know uh, that employees, can see headaches and bringing on a new contract partner and brewing a new beer. But on the flip side, it's also, it offer also offers, you know, uh, something new, you know, a new creative outlet, something interesting. Uh, it's not just dry County IPA for the eighth time this week. Right. So um, I think that uh, I think there, there are definitely uh, pros and cons on both sides for the team. Now looking at, you know, contract brewing, I think we're talking a lot about brands using another production facility to contract brew. But what about, let's say, when a sports team or a restaurant comes to you? Do any of you see engagements like this as successful? I'll, I'll say on, on my end, uh, you know, we've done some some partnerships as Dry County, not as a necessarily a contract brewer per se, but, um, you know, throwing a sports team logo um, or minor league team logo on on one of our cans or brewing, you know, a minor league team beer for them. Um those work and they're fun. And a lot of times it's great partnerships with cool people. Um, but I think that is definitely an area where volume commitments get really important and also get really tricky um, because these entities, unlike a celebrity back brand where their business is producing this new seltzer and selling this new seltzer, and they have a team dedicated to marketing and designing and selling this seltzer when a minor league hockey team comes to you and talks about that, they just want you to do it all and have it all. And, you know, they're not going to know what to do if there's extra product left over. Right. So um, those are fun and cool. They're usually on a smaller scale, at least in our experience. Um, and they usually end up, you know, frankly being a, a little bit of, of a headache on the back end. So yeah, we, we, we've done a little of that just from a white label perspective and that's the easier way to do it. Yeah. We're just, yeah. Uh, but it, it's hard for us to do something and, you know, Small, just for a restaurant. I was going to say, whether it's a restaurant or or more often, or you know, I've seen it with sports teams and and other folks that just want to put a a brand on a label. Um, you also then have to worry about if they're not actually a brewery or are not actually going to own that brand in a long term sense. You really have to worry about the distribution issues as well, right? This is essentially a licensing exercise to the contract brewery, who is then just producing this with their name on it. But your distribution and franchise rights follow the brand, not who produces it or who owns the 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 um, the logo or label or sports team. So you do have to, you know, I always want to have a serious conversation with I know it's going to be cool and you really want to do this. Have you really thought all the way through this and what happens a year from now, two years from now when, you know, maybe the volumes aren't there um, or you need to move from a 30 barrel system to a 50 barrel system? Well, now that that brand is tied to that one brewery from franchise law, right? So there's there's things you really need to think through at at, at sort of second and third tier levels. 
No, Jason, I haven't heard your voice in some time, so I've got a question for you. You know, looking at these contract brew agreements, are they short-term solutions? Do you see them as permanent solutions? What are your observations and thoughts on that? Yeah, it becomes pretty interesting. We, one of the places that we're seeing a lot of contract brewing is when people are going kind of jumping in an expansion, right? So they are, you know, in a 10 barrel system, but demand that, you know, they, they've added the second shift and the third shift, and now they're running this 24 hour machine and they still can't keep up. And so what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we're going to go to a 50 barrel or a hundred barrel or whatever the, the right uh, system is. And so they're coming in, some of them are coming in with these defined terms of, hey, it's going to take us 12 months to do this. And we we need the production now because we've got, you know, in, in this case, in the case of what it was, was they had states asking for the product and they couldn't get them to other states. And so they said, hey, we'll go ahead and contract brew. They found a couple uh, locations that made it kind of convenient for them. And although there was a, you know, uh, wasn't a big profit center for them, what happened was when they could move it into their own production, then they started to grab all that profitability that uh, they weren't getting. And so, you know, sometimes you see that as a relatively short um, bridge. And then other times you're seeing it more of a, hey, this brand is one where like we want to stay small, but we have, you know, 50 barrel demand for this. And yes, we're not going to make a ton of money on it, but it, it makes financial sense for us to just hey, you're going to always brew this brand for us, or at least for you know, the foreseeable future, you're going to do it. So there is a mixture, and I think it becomes kind of what's the purpose of contracting. I think you know, for both sides of this, from a financial standpoint, you kind of, kind of understand. You don't want to just wake up one day and say, we're going to start contract brewing. You need to know why you're going to do it, because it is a headache. Um, and on the reverse side of it, you need to know why you're going to go engage one, because um, you know, the, there are financial, uh, not repercussions, that's not the best word, but there are financial... Um, I want to say consequences. See, listen, listen to these. They all sound negative. They're not all. They're they not sound negative, negative Jason. But, but the implications. 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 There you go. Financial implications, you know, on both sides of this. And so making sure that you get it right and kind of have a, you need to kind of just, just like selling a brewery, you kind of got to start with your exit in, in mind. I think when you go into a contract uh, for contract brewing, you need to start with the exit. It's just going to be short term with a kind of a finite date. Um, or is it going to be kind of a long term play for you? Anybody else have anything they'd like to add to that one? Um, I think we're also, I'm seeing a lot of uh, the folks who um, are in that boat, Jason described, where, you know, our, our core story is to have a small destination brewery and, you know, particularly folks in, in sort of my time of life and later start deciding, I don't want to manage a 50, you know, 50 or 80 or 100 employees, and I don't want to take on a $4 million expansion project to grow to that next level. I just want to produce some more beer and use that distribution network to funnel people back to my location where my I'm going to get my profits. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot of people saying, no, this you know, contract brewing may be a longer term um, operation that this is just all our distribution is going through contract breweries, our on-site sales we do on-site. And you there's know, been a like few in it, non-alcoholic brands take that route. It's been fun to follow their successes. No, well, that's about another one where, you know, I've, I've seen a, a lot of my clients um, look at doing brand expansions. And this goes back to something Trey and Bob said earlier that, you know, OK, now we're going to start doing some seltzers. Now we're starting to do some ciders. Now we're going to, you know, move into some non-alcoholic. Well, if that's not what your brewery is set up for and you're not, you know, especially for a test market, you know, let's see if this brand sticks. Contract brewing is really your best option. To, to, to make that effort and see what happens. I like it. So for everyone here today, you know, how can we best judge the success of a contract brewing agreement? Any thoughts from both sides of the table and from the outside, I suppose? I don't get a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, our, our, our goal is to create a win-win uh, in, in every relationship that we enter into. And so, you know, it's got, you know, that contract agreement's got to be beneficial for both parties. Uh, yeah. Are there any certain metrics you look at, Bob, like, you know, how much you're producing, just how much you're bringing in? Are there any certain KPIs? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it just, I mean, it, it has to, you know, uh, have, have enough volume, you know, to make sense for us. I mean, we can't just brew one batch because we've got a lot of R&D that goes into producing one batch. So, you know, that's not a profitable model for us. So, you know, it, it you, we've got to have a customer that's going to come in as a repeat customer on a, you know, on a, you know, 
steady annual volume. Trey, how about you? You know, how do you judge the success of an agreement? Yeah, I think like John said, if they're not calling calling him or I'm not calling him, then it's good. But uh, <laughs> if if both parties are happy, if if uh, you know to to Bob's point, you know we where we are with our capacity, we like to kind of brew for a partner about about once a quarter, twice a quarter um, on a specific specific beer, right? Um, so if they've signed up with us with multiple beers, that's multiple brews. But um, we don't want to brew once a year, twice a year, and it not be worth it to have brought it on and work through the recipe and source the ingredients and whatever. Um, but but I think it's if we want to see that brand succeed, right? Uh, if they don't succeed, then we don't succeed because we're not going to be brewing their beer anymore. So uh, I think seeing that brewery uh, communications with them, they're they're happy about the growth of their brand and their products, uh, then, then I think that's success, right? Oh, I love that. And I'll say, you know, when I say I don't get a phone call. That's my my measure of ex, uh, of a successful agreement. What I really think that boils down to, and, and hopefully Bob and Trey, you can back me up on this. If you do this long enough, you will have something unexpected happen, right? Whether it's you know something doesn't get to the right uh, terminal gravity, whether you've got a, a material uh, supply issue, something unexpected will happen. And for me, it's a successful uh, agreement. Not that it actually figured out what was going to happen, but that there is a procedure to deal with it and everybody knows how you're going to deal with it. And so it doesn't resolve in, you know, OK, what do we do now? No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. Get away from that. And just as long as there's a procedure to deal with the unexpected, mm -hmm. you know, th that's success in my mind. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a perfect answer of, uh, you know, can you amicably resolve the problems that are inevitably going to come up? Because they are going to come up inevitably and some will have been addressing your contract and some inevitably will have not been addressing your contract because as much as we want to and john wants to think of everything and check every box it's just something new that's never happened before is going to happen right that's how craft beer works so um so that'll work when we were when we were first looking for a contract partner and again we ended up in in mississippi i had had a conversation explored it with a local georgia brewery and the answer i got from him that stuck with me for a long time was uh, and they're, they're still a well-known brewer in Georgia is, you know, Hey, Trey, we, we really like you. You're a, a cool guy. We're friends. I've come in and, and helped, uh, from time to time at their brewery trying to break into the industry. He said, I like you now. I want to like you in five years. So I'm not going to contract brew your beer for you. Uh, he's <laughs> like, inevitably, if, if we do this, then, uh, we won't be friends in five years. So, um, success is probably still being friends in five years, I guess. Trey, that's fantastic. Well, as we wind down, I appreciate all four of you for sharing your unique perspectives. And we're going to start like we're going to end just like we finished. John, first off, how can anyone get a hold of you if they're interested or have any you know, fascinating legal questions to throw you oh. away? And is there anything else you'd like to add? OK, um, sure, so the easy one is, yeah, I'm uh, John at BeerLawCenter.com. BeerLawCenter.com is our website uh, on the socials. We're at Beer Law Center. Any way to reach out to us, feel free. Um, and I guess the issue for me, the thing that if if you don't take away anything else is, you know, reach out and f don't always assume that things are going to work out the way you expect them to. You know, whether you have to hire a lawyer or or talk to somebody about what they've done previously with contract brewing, get it in writing and know, you know, do do your homework and and understand all the issues, I guess. Great having you here, John. Trey, you're up. Yeah, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I'd say probably easiest way is just go on the website, there, drycountybrewco.com. Uh, my contact info is there, or the info at email comes to me as well. So um, you can get a hold of me there. Um, and then, no, I mean, I think we've we've covered a lot of topics and a lot of bases here. It's obviously a huge topic that we could talk for four more hours about. But, um, no, I think it's uh, if, if you're looking to get into to contract brewing on either side, it's just Make sure you're really serious about it and passionate about it and something that that you want to do and uh, and you aren't going to back out at the first first hurdle because there's going to be many. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Trey. Bob, you're up. Yep. Uh, so our website is www.bigkettlebrewing.com. Uh, there's a, a, a spot on the website that you can reach out to us, but also my email is uh, bob at beerrepublicbrewing.com. Is there anything else you'd like to offer as insight? Uh, 
No, I, uh, Andrew, thank you for uh, bringing me on today. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting John and catching up with Jason and Trey. And uh, I, I think this was very insightful for, for me as well. It's been a great conversation. And Jason, if anybody's looking for money and looking for any insight on contract brews, how can they get a hold of you? Well, they should find me in the Craft Beer Professionals Facebook group because that's where I'm hanging You're out. You're always there. Uh, I don't think you have a yeah, real job anymore. You're always in the threads. I try. I try. Uh, no, but there's plenty of other ways. LinkedIn. Uh, they can find my email out. Uh, my phone number is out in the web, wherever, wherever they want to find me. Um, but I think the one thing that I would want to add, just kind of tie a bow on this, is this. it really should be felt like a partnership from both the brand that is contracting and the brewer that is contracting the brand. And we've got uh, the way I kind of look at it is there's this large global capacity that the industry has. And it really is looking for someone who wants that capacity and someone who has that capacity. And you got to find the right partnership to make it work because there's there's always there's always someone out there for you. And you just got to figure out uh, you know who that is. And, and that's going to be the right partnership. You just got to find your soulmate. It might take a little time, but they're out there. Your, your hop, your hop soulmate. <laughs> well, John, Trey, Bob, and Jason, this has been a pleasure learning from you all today. We'll see you all soon. Cheers, everybody. Right. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.